Here we are recording the Mulligan podcast. I just did the Mulligan with that intro. Um, um, this podcast uh, to let people know uh, this is it was inspired by the Mighty Cat Williams, who I'll, I'll respond to later on. Uh, I want my own long form interview, as it were, and so I picked. The perfect person to do this long form comedy conversation, uh, the mighty um, chairwoman of the Delia Destruction Department, Alice Hampton. How are you doing, Alice? Thank you. Welcome, welcome to my club, Shay Shay. We're doing this. <laughs> yeah, club blurry background because we don't want people to see our rooms. Um, I'm not club. sure what are you talking about. <laughs> Yeah, well, I just, I don't know what people would see my stuff. Um, but uh, well, this is the Mulligan podcast because um, for the viewers, how she got into the Chris D'Elia um, destruction department and, uh, and sort of her role as the vigilante of LA comedy. Uh, take it away. I, uh, God, I've always hated Delia. I've always been a Delia hater ever since I moved to LA. I really thought it was going to be like anyone who considered themselves a real comedian hated Delia. I was surprised that people were like not embarrassed to say that they liked him. Uh, and so then my friends tried really hard to sell me on him. And I actually went, they were like, you got to see him live. I actually went to one of his shows. It, it was not for me. It was, it was so bad. But then, I mean, like when everything came out in like 2020, I was just like, oh no, fuck this dude. I was right the whole time. He has always fucking sucked ass and he's a piece of shit too. Like my knee jerk reaction to just hate him. I'm like, it, it, it came from a good place. <laughs> um, and I, I just like, I can't believe anyone would feel like they couldn't hate Crystalia. Cause you know. If and I'm, I mean, they've already accused her of far worse for literally doing stuff that other people of her, um, <clears throat> level of celebrity do with themselves like when she bumped that guy everybody was yelling at her oh which i i'm not supporting but um i i agree with you on the delia thing um he always looked at me at outside the, the belly room at, like he looked at me in disgust like you never seen somebody in a wheelchair in public which and he did it like three or four times and I had to like be like, yo, you got a problem? And then he never did it again. But uh my, my feeling with Delia to sum it up, uh, it's uh and you can tell me if you agree with this. Um whoever what what's that thing from wherever it was like the guy said, um, whatever that guy did, whatever they say that guy did. He did it. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about Delia. Like I don't need, I don't need a, a, a documentary. Although it was very hard to watch, extremely <laughs> hard to watch. Like I had to pause it like three or four times, go take some Mylanta and try to, you know, or through the rest. <laughs> yeah, like it's yeah, it's still. I, no, I'm the same way. People were like, what if he was just messaging the high schoolers? I'm like, that's bad enough. I don't need any more than that. Like, you still, you're cooked. But your story yeah. of, like, glaring at you, A, I don't think, I think I've heard that from other comedians that are handicapped, that he would just glare at them in disgust. But it also reminds me of, like, he was in Texas post-cancellation, and he was doing a spot just, like, at an open mic. I think he was trying to pressure Joe Rogan to let him do time at the mothership, but I don't think that happened. Um, but he was just doing little spots all around Texas and he, uh, he went up at an open mic and then in the open micer who came up after him, Delia like shoulder checked him and was like, try to follow that. And it's like, bro, you need that validation still over like an open micer. It's just like, yeah. it, he's an empty pit of insecurity. Yeah. I mean, the guy's like, the guy's like, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, um, the guy's like, um. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I've always found him to be very creepy, especially the idea that he would market himself as the, um, Bieber's favorite comedian, like, right away, but I think I'll agree, like, you, you, like you said the other day, like, much like his comedy, uh, the reaction at first was very underwhelming, 
uh, very <laughs> underwhelming. Um, and I think there's part, a with it. I, there's a thing to pay uh, Bieber's dad to like. He made some sort of deal with Bieber for Bieber to like say that he his favorite comedian was Chris D'Elia. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a rumor that that was just like a, an endorsement deal. That's like that's like um, somebody with a foot fetish just hanging out at like a salon, you know, just like, do you have an appointment? No, I'm just hanging out. Uh, but like that, that's real. That's really creepy. But like, I mean, I think, I think you, I mean, I think the underwhelming nature of the reaction to the allegations might have been caused by a lot of people just going, who? You know, like... Yeah. Like, <laughs> he, he wasn't famous enough to really cancel. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then... Oh, and then when people, like, two years later, when they realized who that guy was, they're like, oh! Oh, that guy... Oh, yeah, that guy's creepy. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think... I mean, I hate to say it, but the guy's got Christmas wall written all over him as far as where he's going in life. Um, and... And, uh, and, uh, and I think the best thing he can probably do is become a Catholic priest. Um, I, not, I, I don't want to give him any ideas, but that might, that might I don't want to give him any ideas, but Chris Benoit, Catholic priest, <laughs> sounds like you've given him ideas. Well, no, I'm just saying those are like the best and worst scenarios. Like the worst yeah. scenario is he winds up like Chris Benoit's wife where his spouse murders him, um, but, or, or, you know, he, he goes the way of, like, you know, the Catholic Church moves to Rome, becomes uh, a legate in the papal, whatever that place it's called, I'm not Catholic, despite, that, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the, the place, I, I just want to say, okay, as an Irish person, as an Irish person, we're like the Oakland Raiders fans of Catholicism, and and two thousand years never an Irish pope. That's that's unforgivable. Oh shit! Whatever. Okay. Whatever. We had Bono, we had Sinead O'Connor. Okay, all these people would have been. Uh, by the way, I am who I am if it weren't for Sinead O'Connor, and give it up for Sinead. Fight the real enemy, and the real enemy is, you know, injustice and people who don't want to fucking acknowledge it. And that's why you were the perfect person to do this interview that I'm asking you to do, so it's not a real interview. But whatever, <laughs> we'll suspend its belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this might technically be propaganda, who knows? <laughs> I hope so. That's my that's my department propaganda. Um, I wanted to mention you sent me an email about a story of uh, a time that you were performing at the comedy store. You want to get into that? You know, I took a turn in the last eighteen months with my approach to life, and, and I just wanted to go through it and talk about some of the stuff I've seen in comedy and and sort of. I guess where it begins is. Halloween 2022 in that email I uh, sent to you um, if you want to just uh, you can tell them better yeah so you were uh, doing a spot in the main room of the comedy store and yeah, for, for roast battle yeah yeah for roast battle which by the way uh, always like your battles were always the most fun to watch you were like a phenomenal roaster it was like it was so much fun. It, it, you know, you watch two boring white guys call each other a pedophile for three rounds. It's like, whatever, you know? But uh, you were truly one of the best roasters that was, like, showing up on a regular basis. It was really great. And so, I'm like, I was taking pictures for Roast Battle for a long time, so I saw a whole lot of the battles. And uh, so it's kind of, like, embarrassing. I'm thinking that, like, the Roast Battle, like, I understand it's an old building, the comedy store, that they don't have, like, wheels in their um, but it's like, this should be a priority. Just, you know, it, it feels like something they could have easily like fundraised for. But anyway, back to the story, you're performing at the comedy store and they were not able to get you onto the stage. You were supposed to perform and they're like not making it a priority to get you on the stage and just trying to like get people seated. And 
it, eventually I think you told you think I think you told me that, like Nate Welch like had to kind of carry you to the stage and it's like Nate Welch doesn't even work for the comedy store at least at that time he didn't work for the store he might work there now for all I know but and he was just a guy that was hanging out around there. It's like they didn't have any sort of backup plan. They're trying to pick up your chair, which it's like they could damage the chair. They could hurt themselves. And it's just so, like, fucking inconvenient and ridiculous that they couldn't get one of the best roast battlers on stage for roast battle. And there's two entrances to, like, the um, the main room stage, so they could easily turn one of them into, like, a wheelchair ramp. It's mentally when, you know, I... I've been going to the comedy store when I did ringer shows. Oh, um, um, I, 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 I uh, be above bringer shows, but that's just I, my. <laughs> I, I, I did, you know, I did bringer shows in 2014, and I would show up with my own ramp. So I've gotten on stage in the main room, but it's just like in that particular instance, they weren't being collapsed. Like, they weren't being uh, collaborative, and it wasn't a priority for them. And me being who I am, I mean, I asked Nate Welch to be there on the off chance that um, that would happen. Because my, believe it or not, my priority that night wasn't even, like, my own dignity, I guess. My priority was to make sure I was able to put on the show. And and so I got seated in a, a stationary chair that I don't like. You know, like, believe it or not, like, this chair is, like, designed for my posture to help me keep myself sitting up because I can't hold myself up. And so when I'm sitting in a regular chair, I can do it, but it's like I'm going to feel it later on, you know, like a bad car wreck or something. And and it's, it's like, I guess what bothered me is they knew I was going to be there. I, I, yeah, bat- you. I, I battled, you know, twice before in the main room uh, with Olivia Grace and Ryan Nixon. Shout out for winning the world title. Um, hell yeah, man. Good for you. Uh, but uh, so I've, I've done it before. And, and, and what sort of bothered me was just the level of indifference. They, they did it. They weren't really concerned. I'm not going to say they didn't care, but it was just a lack of concern. And that kind of extended into when, um, you know, I talked to the management over the next three or four months. I sent them a memo of everything they needed to do. And to be honest, they were polite, but they weren't. They were kind of placating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then they told they told some folks other people it's very frustrating uh uh but we're not really going to do anything because their position is it's such an old building and you know the city of west hollywood and you know what happened was and that's all i hear is you know they don't want to do it and if i can step outside myself for a second and make some assumptions it's that they're probably saying, well, there's only like nine, nine or 12, you know, it's a comedians in wheelchairs who perform in California regularly who would, you know, and, you know, we can just lift them on stage. Don't you want to be lifted on stage? No, I don't want to be lifted on stage mm-hmm. because, everything. yeah, because, because, how I sit affects my performance, and it's it's a whole like thing, and it's not even personal. It's it's more like I'm most comfortable when I am in this wheelchair, and I give my best shows when I'm in my best environment. And I mean, it kind of did hurt. To, it, it legitimately hurt, you know, because I've been going there for like seven years. Showing up with two wheelchairs, two people to get get up to the belly room, and 
I accept that to do that because I enjoy doing the show and, you know, whatever. But it's a whole different deal in the main room. When, and and it, it, it really shows me how little regard there was when they, they told me that they had no idea this was a problem for, any of the, for anything about their club. And it's mm-hmm. like, I've been going here six years. Yeah. You guys, you got, and look, to be fair to them, they cannot lift me on stage for like insurance purposes. And I don't begrudge them any of that. But you know what they could do? They could say something. They could like say, hey, can we help you get your uh, portable wheelchair up the stairs? Because that's a hundred dollars off Amazon. If that breaks, you know it's it's fine. We'll we'll get another one. We'll figure it out. But it just and then, you know, when I started drawing conclusions, um, I started to really think about it and go, well, I'm not somebody else their wheelchair, and it led to their wheelchair getting broken, and so. Which and, is- deal these wheelchairs are expensive they're like yeah. and they're, to you guys for like yeah. it's, it's and, not- they're, and they're not like the repair process is exceedingly slow like it's it's mm-hmm. like you're 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 not talking like drop your car off at the mechanic and then you know this is like six to eight business weeks yeah it's it's substantial if something happens yeah. Fair. And for the comedy store to just be like, oh, we'll just lift him here and there instead of like, and and at the same time saying like, oh, for insurance purposes, like we can't promise to lift you on the stage or we can't have our people lift you. So it's like, yeah, you've got your own people that are lifting you or like comedian friends who are there to support. But it's like the comedy store, you know, they did like a gay pride float. It's like, okay, well, then you guys can raise money have like a big comedian drive do shows to raise money to make the building accessible to comedians in wheelchairs because yeah it's like in their mind they might be thinking there's only a handful of comedians who even use wheelchairs well hey they comedians look at this building go oh i can't get in there why even try so if they building Uh, uh, and it turned out that that was way too deep of an argument for some people which we'll get to in a minute but (laughs) i also wanted to just point out that like it's the same way at the Hollywood Improv, I found out. Uh, in the main room of the Hollywood Improv, um, uh, Daniel Perez had a similar experience where they couldn't locate the ramp. And it turned out, I guess, some they'd say somebody had stole it out the back door. And I got into, like, a Twitter beef with the Hollywood Improv about whether or not they had a ramp. And, and I don't mean to be... To, to the Hollywood Improv's credit, they they didn't want to admit somebody stole their ramp out their back door. And so, I understand, and I'm not going to, they, uh, Reed is an awesome person, Reed is an awesome person, but, you know, look, Red Bar is still walking, and that's, that's really... The point of this, and I, I just think I'm doing red bars. Thing. Yeah, and I, and so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing because I don't want to be labeled a fool. <laughs> don't label me a fool, Mike. Please don't. I love, I love the comedians that are like, oh, it's an honor to be made fun of by Red Bar, and he's like, no, it isn't. I hate you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like full of being a hater. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I guess that's, but for real, this is legitimately like, I hate to say this, but this is an employment discrimination issue, and other people don't want to be difficult. Well, I guess what I have to do is uh. I have to be the one to be difficult because I don't mind being difficult. Some people would say I'm I'm rather aroused by it. I wouldn't say that, but 
I'm just saying that it affects everybody. And I do mean that because, you know, people can say, well, you know, there's only two or three people in, two or three, maybe a dozen people in wheelchairs. But look, okay, Hollywood Improv and, and the Comedy Store go out of their way to, like, accommodate spell smoking indoors. But they can't accommodate people in wheelchairs. I mean, for a while, for a while, it was easier for a to get on stage with Hollywood Improv than somebody in a wheel, wheelchair. Uh, but, but I, um, I would also point out, and this might be pessimistic, but it's 100% real. We're all one bad day away from being in a wheelchair. That's, yeah. You know, or, or, exactly. or in, in Crystalia Gates, um, one day away from his wife walking in at the wrong moment. What are you doing, Grits? <laughs> ah! Lorena Bobbitt on his motherfucking ass. No, I'm I'm hoping more for like a Ramirez brother type scenario. Just or maybe a maybe a Kurt Cobain type situation, like where we know it was the wife, but we just pretend he did it himself. <laughs> yeah, Allegedly. Anthony, where it's super obvious she did it, but we're like, you know what? We're not gonna check the the computers. Dude, you know how you know Dalia is creepy. OJ posted. Um, well, can you believe how unsettling Dalia is? OJ Simpson finds Chris Dalia creepy. That's <laughs> Chris Simpson posted about Dalia. How did I not hear about this? Holy shit! I, I, well, I'm making it up. I'm just saying it would be funny because that's how uncomfortable. Um, I, Chris Dalia is truly, yeah. truly a fucking ghoul, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but you know. I, I I gotta say I I I found peace with this accessibility thing because I've taken the initiative to create com accessibility and comedy. So if if the store wants to say it's too expensive, it's okay. I got you, comedy store. I will be your one man GoFundMe. Yeah. I will. I don't you want to accommodate yourself so long. You just like fucking, you know, keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I want to accommodate everybody else. I, I legitimately do. Okay, and and people, other people in the Rhodes Battle community might be out there saying that I'm I'm grandstanding or asking for more than I deserve. But I I don't see it that way. I see it as. If you recognize something needs to be done and nobody else is doing it, then you got a fucking obligation to fucking do it. And yeah, that's what the change you want to see in the world type shit. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> not well, corny well, that, but you know, it's yeah, I like you said yeah. that you were not afraid to be difficult because I'm the same way. I'm like, these girls don't want to complain because they don't want to come off like a complainer who's always whining about sexism. Bitch, I don't give a fuck. I'll be the complainer. Like, I have no yeah, problem. It, so I like yeah. the attitude. Yeah, I like to complain. It, 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 yeah, it, none of the other disabled comedians want to be the one to, like, you know, jump on the yeah, ground. And that's, and that's no fucking shade at them. Because yeah. no, the other reason is there's me, there's Daniel Perez, there's Greg Roquet, and they did great roast battles. Okay, Greg's a great writer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Daniel Perez is a baddie on on um, Kirby enthusiasm. Never mind my ass, my small potato ass. These two people are already to, ready to be paid regulars if they were able to showcase in a safe and permanent manner. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and and on top of that, on top of that, let's let let's just say, look. There's probably another comedian in a wheelchair who ain't started doing comedy yet, and mm -hmm. we don't we don't know about it. He he or she or they are out there, uh, and frankly, this might sound like delusions of grandeur, but I for whoever they are, I want to make it fuck easy for them. An afterthought, they won't even have to, have to worry about it. Battle, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and and if that means I burn my bridge, 
I I don't really give a shit. Cause, cause all my heroes died fighting the British Empire. They literally died in gunfights and uh, public executions fighting the British Empire. And I can't fight the British Empire anymore, so I have to find my activities where I can get them. You know? Yeah. And, you know, you saying that, you know, there's motherfuckers around the comedy store that are like, oh, he's, you know, he's asking for too much because he wants, you know, the comedy store to be accessible to people who use wheelchairs. You know, the same the same person who said that to you when I was on the comedy store documentary, one of my they use one of my jokes without paying me. They use three of my pictures that I took without paying me or crediting me that I took those pictures or asking for permission. Doesn't matter. I don't give a fuck. I was honored to be part of it. But that same person messaged me and they were like, Alice, you're on the Comedy Store documentary. You know, now you can't let anyone say anything bad about the Comedy Store because you're like in the family now. And I was like, what the fuck at the time? So for you to even go and say like the Comedy Store just needs to be wheelchair accessible. That's not crazy. But there are these sort of like, you know, Comedy Store cult members who float around the store who will look at you and be like, oh, he's, he's talking shit about the store. And that's kind of a gross fucking attitude that well, I... Well, especially when I'm like, it's to me, it's the opposite. I love the comedy store. Yeah. I love Rose Battle. Can you hear me, guys? I love Rose Battle. I'm making direct eye contact. <laughs> no, people don't believe me when I say that I love the comedy store and I love the Hollywood improv. It's like, the, I get pissed because the rapists shouldn't be up in there like they don't deserve to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be able to do Monday Rays, you know, because I, I, I've heard about that that show for years, and I haven't tried really hard enough to try get on there because it wouldn't be worth the 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 the, the one way um, logistics that it would take. <coughs> It's like absurdly inconvenient for someone in a wheelchair to yeah, get on stage. Yeah, yeah, and whether they like it or not, I draw the conclusion that that's basically another way of saying we're not open to people in wheelchairs. We're not. We mm-hmm. don't want people in wheelchairs. And and I I do take it personally. I yeah. do take it personally. And I don't know if that is me grandstanding. But I definitely take it personally. <laughs> so Well, I think you know, you're telling me that the comedy store only has one paid regular that's in a wheelchair. Well, one well one person who's got a mobility issue. I mean, but there's there's also, you know, people little people. There's a lady who's a former pro uh pro wrestler who's a paid regular. And so it's not only just <laughs> people in wheelchairs, <coughs> but it's people with mobility issues, yeah. you know, like, if, if they're all about cultivating talent, they mm-hmm. should be about accommodating talent, and I, I don't think I'm unreasonable or revolutionary for saying that, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm pretty obvious, you know, like. Uh, I understand how some of these older historical buildings get grandfathered into yeah. what sort of rules, I get it. But they should, it would be really easy for them to put forward an effort to make their building wheelchair accessible and like immo- like for people with, Im- uh, with mobility issues. It wouldn't be that hard for them to just get some big name celebrities together and do a little fundraiser. But if they don't want to do that, then it's like, okay, then fuck it, you know, wheelchair, yeah. gotta do it. Yeah, and I do have a GoFundMe accessibility and comedy initiative. Uh, and I guess... I guess <laughs> I was talking to some, some people and who told me that it was too expensive, and I'm like, okay, what's what's the number? And when the, when they wouldn't give me a ballpark number, because again, they don't have to tell me anything. They don't want to tell me, but I said, just give me a give me a number you're comfortable with telling me. You know, and when they wouldn't even do that, I'm like, you haven't looked into this, have you? You haven't, you haven't done the homework, have you? And it's it's like, I won't, I'm going to tell this story and I don't give a fuck, okay? 
Let's go. I, I, I was over there and uh, uh, somebody, one of the two people who are very important people over there, no other a man than a woman, two people, um, let's call them E and R. Okay. Do you know, do you know, one is the talent manager and one is the building manager, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know R, right? I don't think I know R, but I know E. Uh, what's the opposite of poor? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Um, do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, and what is it? Somebody who measures clothes. Okay, okay, I got you. A wealthy, a wealthy tailor. Um, <laughs> um, um, I, I mentioned to him that there was a GoFundMe. And he turned to the person who was with me, driving me, my caregiver, who doesn't care about the, any of this at all. Is it involved in this? Yeah. <laughs> and, and he just, and this guy who's, you know, he wouldn't look at me as he was like lying to my caregiver. You know, we've, we've looked at a bunch of options. There's, there's just nothing we can do. No, you know what this is? This is a nasty garage or a nasty attic that you don't, it's too much, it's overwhelming. Look, I understand it's overwhelming. It, it's overwhelming to find out that disabled people exist. Believe me, I would suck to Nepal too. Uh, but you can't do you can't do nothing. You know, like yeah. it's, it's that might not be grammatically correct, but it's morally correct. You can't do nothing, and because. It affects everybody because what if somebody, like, what if somebody with a, what if one of the people like you were, we were talking about, the guy who, who, who is told you to be the cult member, mm -hmm. what if that guy is like talking some shit on the internet like he does and he just slips and falls on his own ego and, and now he's in a wheelchair like million dollar baby. He's going to want that comedy story to be accessible. Okay. Yeah, and so it, it changes motherfucking tune. Yeah. Yeah, um, and it, it's not like this guy has a disabled sister either. Yeah, and there's also the thing of like, if you live long enough, if you're lucky enough to live long enough, you will become disabled. Like, if yeah. you make the old age, your eyes go, your hips, your knees, you, you know, it's like every single person who, like, we're all just pre-disabled right now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, not yeah. just for fucking all of us. If Dave Chappelle lives, you know, really long and, and when, gets in the wheelchair, when, then they'll fucking do, but when, we when have the, to wait for that. When the next uh, trans person uh, uh, gets in some of that business, he's gonna be in it with, uh, by the way, I, I'm not gonna talk too much about Dave Chappelle other than I do think it was wrong that they broke that guy's arm when he was already restrained. That's not cool. I mean, that, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I mean. <laughs> I think I think Dave Chappelle is going to die the same way Norm MacDonald did, where they're like, after a secret battle with cancer. And it's like, he for sure, Dave Chappelle's gotten that lung cancer diagnosis. And they're like, 18 months, dog. That's what you got. No, he's, he's going to die in some steroid rage. Because... <laughs> He juiced up. He juiced up like a bottle of Minute Maid. Like he just okay. I'm a pro. I'm a lifelong pro wrestling fan. Okay, I know juicing when I see it. Okay. Chappelle and Carrot Top. Why? What are they? What are they doing? Carrot Carrot Top's Carrot Top's a little more natural. Okay, and I will say in Dave's defense, he did do the working out to like. Because, look, some people who are juicing try to, like, work out a lot because they think it'll, like, they, it'll even it out. But you can still, there's just dead giveaways. And he's, like, I feel bad because one time he came in during a roast battle and I was like, oh, shit, DMX. And, uh, uh, 
He was like, fuck you, you look like Fozzie Kratz in this motorcycle. And I, like, to this day, I'm like, that's the coolest thing anybody ever said. But I will say that I, I, I'm not going to knock Dave Sappel because I think Dave Sappel is doing um, Tony, Tony Clifton. He's, he's repurposing Tony Clifton. And, and, and the thing about Tony Clifton is you would never admit to being Tony Clifton. So he's never going to admit to being Tony Clifton. But I legitimately have reason to believe that he's doing the Tony Clifton. <laughs> I'll tell you about it later. It's, uh, okay. uh, but it's, it's, you know. Do you, want, do you want to talk about Tim Dillon, uh, Tim Dillon selling subprime mortgages? <laughs> um. Well, yeah, um, well, yeah, because I guess I could tie it into the fact that this guy, that guy is a paid regular. Again, somebody who's a prime candidate for needing a wheelchair soon. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's saying Timmy's got some cholesterol problems, cholesterol problems. Um, yeah, you better you know, beat while he still got him. Yeah, probably, probably a lot of butter in his diet. Or a lot of butter, but 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 er, was that some was that some accidental humor? Anyway, uh, I I I just think this guy, because this is how it ties in Tim Dillon. Mm-hmm. I've been told police by people I love, you know. People I love have been told policing me on this issue about accessibility, and they're telling me, "Be careful! You don't want to, you don't want to say the wrong thing." It's like Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon has been banned from Airbnb for making terrorist, arsonistic threats against fellow gay people over. A four hundred and fifty dollar charge, right? Yeah, he left like beans and fish in the hotel that they had to clean up in the Airbnb. <laughs> by the way, Ugh. you can always tell the weird bad people by the weird diets that they keep. You know, like yeah. be- beans and fish. Come on, what are you like a seventy-two year old Irish person who lives alone? You know, like. It's so there's sad. Comedians who think their jacket's cool, and then there's comedians who are obsessed with their own diet. And <laughs> it's like, come on. Yeah, yeah. And like, I, I, he's one of those Rogan brats that Cat Williams talked about in yeah. his, uh, in um, his, in, in his, in his, um, and I will say this, and I don't know if we'll disagree on this, and maybe you can give me your thoughts, but. As much as I enjoyed the entertainment value of what Kat said, a lot of it was just like homophobic. Like, gay people freak me out, so I'm going to accuse a bunch of people I don't like of being gay. Like, it's, it's, and the idea, I'm sorry, but the idea that somebody sold their soul for soul playing is just so. <laughs> I don't like. I uh, okay. I guess he got back at Smiley by making him be in a dress for yeah. the movie, and it's like, bro, yeah. what? Wait, what? so you put a guy in a dress? So yeah. you put a guy like you put he, a guy? Yeah, he's getting mad at Hollywood putting guys in dresses, and then he puts a guy in a dress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like, but he's not on drugs. You see, he's not on drugs. Just no, like yeah, him. I got a bad respect for Cat Williams, but I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I don't know if he's on drugs or if he's just if he's just Cat Williams. I mean, I I felt like he was doing a pro wrestling thing where you, like, where he was like, I was like, okay, because he said, uh, and yeah, we are. We are skipping Tim Dillon for a sec to talk about a real comedian, Cat Williams. Uh, a minute. <laughs> okay. He said he read like 12 books a day, or like eight books a day, running a 4 3. 
uh, what else did he say? Yeah, like, what other... Yeah, the running, he can actually run fast as a motherfucker. Do you see that oh. episode of Atlanta? Come on. He, he but was but, but that's, what, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, he said all this stuff that sounds like bullshit, and then he runs the full three, and you see it, you're like, okay, what were the name of the books? Were, yeah. they, go were they Goosebumps? Because Goosebumps were really easy to read. Like, what... Like he was what like age 8 to 13. I'm like, okay, so kids' books? You could tear through eight kids' books a day. Come on. No, but, but like, okay, there are some bigger kids' books that are, like, written for kids that are a little bit more smart. And <laughs> and so, like, but even those are, like, 75 pages. And yeah. it would take me, like, a week to get through one of them. And I was like, but I don't know. I don't know. But I do... I do kind of agree with the idea that, like, I don't think Cedric the Entertainer sold his soul, because who would buy, like, what, what's, you know? Who's out here buying souls, is the question. Yeah, and, and, and really, I mean, <laughs> a lot of that selling the soul stuff, literally, it's just, you know that they only accuse, like, black artists of doing that, right? Like, Robert Johnson, Beyonce, you know. But, and I'm not saying I like Steve Harvey. He did rip off uh, yeah. uh, um, Mr. Cooper. The, um, um, I'm a stoner, and I'm not, not remembering his name. I'm a stoner, and I'm forgetting his name. Um <laughs> The guy who got ripped off by Steve Harvey, uh, um, I'm Mark Curry. Thank you, thank you. I almost said Don Curry, but I'm like, yeah, but nobody would rip off Don Curry because Don Curry would beat the shit out of them and like throw. Um, I would, but I'm on camera. Yeah, um, I'm not, um. <laughs> Bam. Um <coughs> Excuse me. I got a call. <coughs> yeah, I got <coughs> I had to hit my inhaler. <laughs> I had to hit my inhaler. Very important, very important. <laughs> <laughs> I had to hit my inhaler. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to say, well, going back to one thing, because um, we're at 45 and I'm trying to, <laughs> we got like 30 minutes. Um, or I'm trying to do like under an hour and a half or whatever. But, yeah. um, and we can also uh, edit around some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just wanted to say one more thing about the comedy store. <coughs> I remember another guy named Joe who who uh, who took on the comedy store for the right reasons. Oh, yes. You sound like a youth pastor. There was another guy named Joe. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't think... I don't know if he's around anymore. I don't know what happened to him. I think he might have upset. <laughs> yeah, old. What happened to the guy who who you could get stoned with and have some fun conversations? And why did he use the N word so many times? <laughs> you know, my favorite Joe Rogan story is um uh, Cynthia Eleven was skateboarding on the patio of the comedy store. And oh! He offended and he choked her out and she thought she was going to die and had to go to the hospital and they were like, yeah, your larynx is crushed and she couldn't talk for like two weeks because he put her in a fucking blackout. Whatever happened to old Joe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, what happened to the guy who had Roy braids and attacked an innocent woman for skateboarding? Yeah. The, 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 Defend the honor of the comedy store. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. 
about these comedy store cops. It's like, you, I, I have someone who's like, I will never perform with Alice Hamilton because she insulted the Hollywood improv. And it's like, bro, you can't simp for a fucking building. Well, I gotta say, if you were gonna simp for a club, I, I suppose, I did say not that I would, but I would, I would definitely go for the comedy store before the Hollywood improv. Cause right. then it's like, well, what's next? You know, I ride or die for the comedy chateau. All right, I will die for the comedy chateau. <laughs> Don't you ever say a bad word about fourth wall? Like, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah, or third wheel, or fucking cardboard box. Uh, <laughs> Cardboard box on the side of a freeway. That uh, you know, you will never, you will never insult the storage, the storage container bike. That <laughs> dare you? How dare you bring up the public storage open mic? And <laughs> what? Like. Watch your fucking mouth. <laughs> you watch your mouth about the cigar shop show. Um, like, it's like, what are we talking about? What are we fucking doing? Like, you got, you can love comedy, but you can't love a fucking a pile of bricks, dude. And, and, you know, it's not like, I always felt like with that guy, the effects in this one way. Like, the comedy store yeah. is not riding and dying for any one person. All right. It's comedy it's club a, can't get back. <laughs> or, I mean they might have Joe Rogan's back, but but like they're definitely not doing it for old horseshoe McGillicuddy. All right. And and that's what I call him. Horseshoe McGillicuddy. Um <laughs> I I would love to settle it the proper way. You know, he wrote Smattles, I wrote Smattle, and I I would like to set. I've offered to settle it the proper way, mm -hmm. and I I would I would I would do what I could to get up there, and I would and if he wants to say that stuff, and we can have a loser leaves the store battle. That's right. <laughs> the stakes are so high. <laughs> yeah, higher than the belly room. <laughs> but uh, going back to what was it we were talking about? Somebody really insignificant. Oh yeah, Tim Dillon. Yeah. Um, um, so this guy, I mean, Joe Rogan hands him a career in whenever. When when did I? When did we first start hearing about Tim Dillon? Oh, 2018 ish. Yeah, and why? I mean, I don't. I've never heard. To quote Cat Williams, tell me your favorite Tim Dillon joke. Tell me your favorite. I mean, you want to talk about a plant. This guy's a bag of fertilizer. Um, I mean, I mean, this guy, nobody, nobody can tell me why he left New York. Can anybody, can anybody ask me, can somebody answer me, like, why, why this guy who supposedly can sell tickets in New York because they got him on the Patrice O'Neill thing for some reason. For some reason. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, they got him on the memorial sale for Patrice O'Neill. Explain that. Explain that. And the reason is it's because he can sell tickets in the area. And and it's like... I, I, mean, I mean, maybe... Maybe because he looks like Patrice doing whiteface. Um, that's a horrible, that's a horrible, horrible thing to say. But I, uh, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand that the hierarchy is what it says it is. This guy is a nobody. Why is this guy a paid regular? Can, you know what I mean? That guy, that cult guy we were talking about, that mm -hmm. guy's objectively funnier than Tim Dillon. That yeah. guy, that guy is more dynamic and funnier on the spot, and he deserves to be a paid regular. Now, his attitude about it might be shit, but, like, he's, 
I respect that guy, that guy as a comedian. Yeah. And I'm not saying his name because I I know it would hurt some other people. So I don't want to say his name out of respect. But I disagree yeah. with his yeah. But but I I love everybody in Rose Battle, even if they don't kinda understand where I'm coming from all the time. But um Tim Dillon is the problem with um the the meritocracy, I guess, or the lack thereof. Because And it's like how can you say it's a meritocracy if not even every comedian can get on your stage? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they want you to perform on the side of the stage because who doesn't want to do that? You know, but um I'd love to stand on the side of the main stage and tell my jokes. Yeah, it's it's not a good it doesn't help my cause, but um Tip Dylan, I mean, he'll he'll need a wheelchair one day, and he, like, people tell me to be careful, but this guy literally is, okay, just think about this. You know that he's got one of the biggest uh, Patreons active right now. Like, he's, he's doing really well on Patreon. Um, God, God bless capitalism's heart. Uh, but, uh, um... I am worried for anybody who contributes to his, Tim Dillon's Patreon because this guy, this guy is on camera uh, in content that you can find ironically behind a paywall, um, um, telling you, telling his audience who are ostensibly donating to his um, Patreon that he, in another time of his life, he was a drug addict who normally sold subprime mortgages that crossed the global economy in 2008. Like, doesn't that seem like a recipe for, like, disaster when you have somebody who is a verified financial predator, which I think anybody who would be involved in subprime mortgages it's kind of sketchy, and now he's handling, I mean, I guess if you're willing to give Tim Dillon money, like, I guess you don't care, but you know what I'm saying? It just feels like a recipe for disaster, and I mean, look at the people who he kind of hangs out with. There's um, um another female regular, uh, well, one of his friends, uh, she's using him to do like promotion for her dates, right? Did I show you that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You and I both know this female comedian is all the time telling everybody how hard it is to be a woman in comedy, but then she's gonna jump up and have uh, Tim Dillon, who, who is like, if you listen to this guy, he's a he's a low key racist. There's a Donald Sterling Tim Dillon tape out there somewhere. There's I think Tim Dillon is a high key racist. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a cop for like shooting fat black girls before. It's, it's he's you know, he's yeah, really dumb. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I can actually tie that racism back to the thing about subprime mortgages because oh, Timmy's not stupid, right? To me, it's stupid, right? You have to be at least some way of smart to be that big of a grifter. And I do mean big. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, he's a comfort eater. Uh, um, he, uh, he, I, oh, right. Um, when he talks about his role selling subprime mortgages, he goes out of his way to clarify that he wasn't one of the bad actors who who was like collateralizing bad debt as a toxic asset. He was only the guy making the bad debt that they literally like. He's not the fentanyl maker. He's just the the Chinese uh, pharmaceutical company selling the precursor to the deadly drug, right? Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon was the Chinese pharmaceutical company in the 2008 subprime mortgage. 
selling the precursor substance to the ultimate, you know, poison. Um, in this case, collateralized debt. I studied this before I became a comedian, and I think, I, and then he'll like, he'll like talk about like he didn't do any of that, but he also said that it's the government's fault for letting him do this because uh, because they outlawed redlining. They outlawed redlining and they made banks, they opened up the lending process to, to marginalized communities. And he's literally on camera uh, with uh, uh, Chris Stefano and- uh, um, That fucking the, idiot. The Greek, the other Greek guy, the, the, the Greek. I'll call him the Greek. I won't say his name, the Greek. Uh, you know, uh, Yana. Y- 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 Tim Dillon is trying to be like a venture capitalist now, and it's like. Oh, well, he, he that's the other thing. You want to talk about you're not supposed to sit on comedy. This guy sits on stand-up all the time. He, he cancels shows to go out to eat. Hey, bro, <laughs> if you want to cancel work to go out to eat, be a cop. All right? <laughs> Ooh, hey. Um, Ooh, hey. No, bits here. No, fucking, like, he's canceling shows to go out to eat. They fucking feed you at the shows. You, the venue's menu is not enough for you? Like, no, no, he's, 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 a, he's a boozy. He's a boozy eater sometimes. Beans on the menu, I guess. Well, no, he's, that's, can you imagine being the service staff for this guy? <laughs> Can you imagine a tip, or do you think he's like you didn't work hard enough, <laughs> you didn't earn it? He no, he definitely tips big because okay. he he's the type of guy who wants people to like defend him. So he'll be like he'll you know he'll make grand you know gestures like that just because he's smart. But like the guy literally defended redlining as a reason for the 2008 crisis, and it's like he kind of contradicts himself in the video. Not that people are gonna watch it, but like, believe me when I tell you, he somehow blames the bigger companies for making the debt uh, cl- uh, toxic asset. He says I didn't do that. But really, the real problem with them doing that was the uh, outlaw, outlawing redlining and redlining and bank lending. And, and it's just, he didn't need to do that. He could have stopped at the first, you know what I mean? But he, he went out of his way. over explaining himself because he, yeah, <laughs> he yeah, kind of yeah. Stay away from Yeah, that. and then he's like, oh, I, I was on purpose, uh, you know, and it's like, that doesn't make it all right, you know. Yeah. But uh, you know, and then and then you know, other female comedians will uh, use him to promote their dates. But then he's literally got their friends fired. Like these, he's, this, he's this, very this, misogynist, this. which is so stupid because it's like, you know, a straight guy's misogynist because he sees a gorgeous woman, he wants her, he can't have her, and he's like, "You fucking bitch, you, you know, you wouldn't let her, let me touch you." But then when you see Tim Dillon, he's like, look at all these whores with their tits out. It's like, that doesn't mean I, anything. I, I think he's <laughs> lying about being gay. You think he, you think he's lying? He's queer baited, queer baited, what do they call it, queer fishing? <laughs> yeah, because I think, I think he has, the way some people have denial about being uh, gay, he has denial about being straight. He's a closeted straight man, all right? And that's what I'm going to say. And all I'm saying is, for a man of his size, it's got to be claustrophobic up in there. And we should we should pity poor Timothy. But not in the context of comedy. Because this man is a malignant tumor on, on everybody. Because... I mean, he defended he, Rush Limbaugh. And it's like, bro, screaming's not a punchline. you got to fucking... Yeah. Well, not according to him and his friends. Uh, hump the stool, hump the stool, hump the stool. Uh, I'm kidding. If Joe Rogan wants to donate to my accessibility and comedy initiative, I will gladly take that Spotify money. Um, 
because he she should and 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 I think he would legitimately. I even think I think Tim would even support this because he needs tax write off. Um, but uh, Rogan's building. I hope the comedy mothership is uh, acceptable. No, they no, they totally are. He he, from what I heard, this could be fluff, but he apparently told the builders the comedy store is not accessible. I want them to be accessible. I doubt that, but it makes me feel nice in my head if I tell myself that story. But I, I did want to get one more person because I know you got to go and you're you're busy pummel, <laughs> pummeling Delia, which I want to kind of, maybe we can say that. Where do you think it ends for Delia? Um, I mean, it's fun watching his career fizzle out, but I do think this is going to end in, in handcuffs. The, uh, like it took the FBI two years to get Jared Fogle and that was the most child porn they've ever like scooped up in one fucking heist or whatever. And even that took two years. So the wheels of justice move slow when it's the rich white guy, but he is not out of the woods yet. That's my opinion. Well, or he's in the woods right now as we speak. And burying a body in the woods. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm betting my money on like, um, somebody is snapping and dealing with it the old fashioned way. But that's just. Oh, that's, I mean, he that, better fucking find a fucking underground bunker to live in if a doctor ever tells me alice you got eight months left oh okay thank you for letting me know i'll be at walmart buying guns you're, and you're gonna you're gonna be like yes yes <laughs> yes <laughs> and he's gonna be like are you sure i mean uh, it's yeah it's, no i won't even shed a tear alice it's terminal you got you know no 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 thank you for letting me know i have you know it's like the motherfucking man in alcatraz i have more people to kill <laughs> You give you give him a you give him a shoulder tap like good talk, bro. Good yeah. hustle. Uh, Been real. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll give you a good deal for you. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just, I mean, and you know what? It's I forgot to mention this that like uh, speaking of pedophiles, um, I mean, I mean, as you know, um. Everybody's saying, right, that Stephen Hawking went to Epstein's Island. And if that's true, does that mean that Epstein's Island is more accessible <laughs> than all three rooms of the comedy store? You should be playing Epstein's Island. Fuck. <laughs> well, no, I, but well. Uh, no, Joe, let's get you on the Lolita Express. Uh, 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 no, well. <laughs> No, it's really hard to it's really hard to get wheelchairs on planes. That's like uh, if you ever have wheelchairs all the time, it's insane. Yeah, they drop them like they don't care. It's kind of like and I feel bad because like my uncle's in a wheelchair and he's like grumpy and I don't he won't see this ever. So like but he'll blame the person in the wheelchair, he's like that's what you get for trusting them. And I'm like, that's not. That's I, not the lesson. <laughs> and, and no, but like, after like 20 years of hearing that, I become my uncle. Because I'm like, well, that's what do you expect? Like, yeah. And I totally victim blame on, on these, these poor people in wheelchair too. But it's like. I don't know. I, I just maybe I want there to be one day our own airline for people in wheelchairs. I think that's probably the solution. Our own airline, and it has to be subsidized by the other fucking airlines because they know they can't help us. And, and so they broke they, a lot of wheelchairs. They owe it. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like I don't want a lawsuit. I just want to fix the problem. That's how I approach life. Whatever yeah. we got to do to fix the problem. If 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 Delia needs to put on a collar, like a sock collar or a, a priest collar or something, you know, maybe both. Uh, if he needs to be cloistered, like go the way of uh, go the way of Pope Benedict, you know. But 
I don't know, you know, with Dalia because yo, you know who my favorite Dalia defender was. Who? Uh, well, besides the fact that old uh, old waterworks Brandon Shaw, it's like I can't believe he lied to me. Oh yeah, I, I gotta. Sh- I'm I'm gonna show that clip to my boyfriend after this because he hasn't seen Sean crying. <laughs> it's it's literally like. I feel bad for Saab because, as I told you before, I think him and Bra- Dalia and Callan are probably lying to this poor brain damage. So, like, he just, like, okay, guys, whatever you say. They take him <laughs> Yeah, and then he's paying them, and they put him in charge of their salary, which totally seems not exploitative at all. Like, <laughs> like dude. And now he's quitting comedy. You know, we lost another disabled comedian. Another one. Another another disabled comedian who couldn't get past the comedy store. Uh, (laughs) But uh, my my favorite Dalia defender was the guy is a guy who fucking stood by Dalia even after the Kyle Anderson documentary. Sam Tripoli. Motherfucking Sam Tripoli. Ten toes down for Chris D'Elia. Yeah. Ten foil hat down for, you know. And you know why they call it the ten foil hat, right? Because he, <laughs> Sam Tripoli, is free base. He's like a motherfucker. It's smoking cocaine out of some, you know. Why is he trying to get anyone to believe that he's sober? It's like, bro, we can see you. Yeah, that's like that's like me going, no, I I I'm a I'm a wolf champion top dancer. And you're like, what? Well, if I can say I'm triply. Oh yes, please. I'm sorry about that. Somebody asked me. Um, Good. Uh, but um but yeah, Sam, um this is documented. He's been delia defending Delia since day one. Like, I wouldn't even venture to say that, like, Sam Tripoli has put more effort into defending Chris Scalia than Chris Scalia has put into defending Chris Scalia. Like, like... Oh, real. <laughs> Sam Tripoli is his fucking, like, you know, the court of public opinion lawyer or something like that. And it's like, has Delia ever even said Tripoli's name? He's never, like, done a podcast or two. It's like, why is Tripoli... Going so hard for Delia when Delia is like not even probably. He, would, he would not. He would not be seen dead with Sam Tripoli. Cause Sam Tri- he would glare at him like he was mentally disabled because he is. <laughs> uh! <laughs> but Sam Tripoli is too fucking stupid to be like, oh, Delia's looking at me. He must think I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, and it sucks because before I was a comedian, and like what YouTube came out in what 2000. And- Six. Uh, eight, six. It was um, after the nip slip, Janet's nip slip, wasn't it? Or was it, no wait, it was J-Lo's and dress maybe, up. Maybe, know. or it was Andy Milanakis, and people were, like, upset with, and that, that was my <laughs> show. Yeah, which, I wonder whatever happened to him. Um, probably racist, but, um, um, <laughs> most Greeks are. Um, uh, I'm really down on Greek people. Okay. Um, uh, I'm. I, there, there are no Greeks, no Russians. Um, terrible salad dressings. <laughs> um, um, but Italian salad dressing is more Italian. It's less Italian than Olive Garden. But um, like I almost feel like Delia's best move is to just come out and be like, "Hey, look, I'm Italian." What can I, like, I think that would be more, um, believable, but Sam, Sam legitimately believes that Delia is being set up, and, and it's like, and I, I, I almost feel bad for Sam, because, also, I just gotta make one other observation about Sam, too. Sam runs one of the most booked, one of the biggest uh, weekly shows at the comedy store. Yeah. 
comedy chaos. And so this guy is kind of like an informal pacemaker in LA comedy. He's a gatekeeper, all right? Yeah. He's a gatekeeper because a lot of people who who want to get on at the comedy store uh, are hoping to get in through that avenue. And so this, this cracked out to Wawa, man. It's literally a gatekeeper. And that seems like not good, like no. a not good thing. But and his pretty uh, chaos posters is always five white guys and Whitney, five white guys and Eliza every yeah. start- fucking week. Five white guys and Ian Edwards. And it's like, how many fucking white guys are you trying to put on, dude? Yeah, it's, it's like, and he's not even, I think he's Arab. You know, it's like. He's fucking Armenian. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Yeah, oops. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I'm gonna get my ass kicked or get kicked out of the liquor store. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, no, Armenians make great food. Um, like, shout out to all Armenian food. But the one thing, too, I want to say about Sam Tripoli, you gotta always say when talking about Sam Tripoli, the one thing you gotta always say. It's that red bar it's walking. Um and uh and, and Sam I mean Sam reveals who he is with Red Bar because yeah. he he's out here whether or not you like what Red Bar says about Triple A or whether or not you think, you know, maybe he went too far. Let's just say for the sake of hypotheticals he did go too hard on Sam Triple A. Sam Triple A Literally called somebody who gave Dave Chappelle a bad review um, an enemy of the people. Like, he went full Nazi on on somebody for lightly criticizing Dave Chappelle. So, this guy is no Mr. Breed's speech. No. And, the, and then he's full on QAnon adjacent. He sees, like, pre- you know, whatever everywhere but the one guy right in front of them Chris D'Elia or or you know Callan you know he will he doesn't believe it he doesn't believe it you know and and, yeah. he, and it's the same with Rogan Rogan's like worried about trans people being groomers and he's got Anthony Cumia on the show and he's got Brian Callan on the show it's like what the but fuck not but, not about- Dula, but not D'Elia he completely <laughs> erased D'Elia like like, he completely erased Delia, And that's how I kind of knew how guilty he was when the, when, when the okay. governor fucking, fucking erased him. Because <laughs> they gave him the old WWE where they just erased somebody. Um, by the way, who knew Vince McMahon was such a shithead? Who could have guessed? Who could have seen that coming? Well, <laughs> did, did you read about the... The, the all the allegations. No, I just saw the headline that he stepped down. What would he do? <laughs> you didn't hear about the Vince I, story. I knew that. I knew it was sexual misconduct. I didn't. I didn't see the details though. Okay, so <laughs> we all knew it was bad. <laughs> you know, we knew it was bad. All right. I knew it was bad because I've seen Vince McMahon answer a question, how does it feel to be a hated man? And he literally said something to the effect of that he doesn't mind what people say about him because he's a billionaire who started life being uh, abused in a North Carolina trailer park. But that he didn't say abuse. He was a lot more graphic. Um, and again, not the takeaway. Like, like, and so basically what happened, among other things, long and short of it is, he passed a hookup around. He trafficked her to two guys. Um... One of the two guys, um, he, during the threesome, they held her down. That's all I can say as per the reporting. But then then there's one more detail that it's not, 
look, it's not the worst part compared to what I just said. That is the worst part. You know, that's the worst part, bar none. But, apparently during another threesome, Vince McMahon allegedly defecated on this woman's head. Yo, okay. <laughs> Whatever else they said he did, he did. Jesus Christ. And it sucks because that's not the worst thing he did. Obviously, the worst thing he did was, you know, the non, the non-consent part. But... And that's not accidental humor, but, but, good God, like, of all the people, of course he did that, and every, look, I, look, I want to complain about something, okay, everybody's been saying, and they're not necessarily bad people, but they're just, let's just say they're misguided, and they're naive, everybody's reacting to this, Alex, it's been, I can't imagine that he was such a stable guy. I can't imagine this. Who could have thought saw this coming? He flushed his whole legacy down the toilet. Not a great metaphor to use in this situation, first of all. But. Also, I instantly believed it. I instantly believed it. <laughs> me too, right? Like. Who could have seen this come? Anybody. Huh. A lot of people. This man has a wrestling segment called the Vince McMahon Kids My Ass Club that involved people who were trying to get their job back having to kids his bare ass. <laughs> Yo, um, what the fuck? Okay. <laughs> Watch wrestling. <laughs> okay. This guy also tried to do a storyline where he implied he had relations with his own daughter, or at least he wanted to. He also did a storyline, which I don't really know how to explain, but I know it was bad, called the Kathy Vick storyline, you'll have to look it up. Owen Hart died from a 40-foot fall to the ring. <laughs> Vince McMahon paid off a small town police force with a bag of money to cover up Jimmy Snooker killing somebody. You couldn't see this coming. You, none of you could see this coming. I could see this coming many years ago. Shit, a black karate master could see this coming. Ah! <laughs> the man was doing this stuff, these devilish, these, these malicious menage trois, if you will. Um, and by the way, somebody mentioned that the defecation was not consenting from either other participant, which means he, not even his accomplice was in on the do scene, which makes us wonder was it was it voluntary? You know, because oh. he is old, right? He is old, and and nope. look, Damn. you know, look, you get older. I mean, I'm only 37, and sometimes it's a it's a little bit of a emergency. Look, or you know, sometimes you drink too much tap water, and you're. I mean, I don't run to the bathroom. I'm more like help, help, <laughs> but. <laughs> How I, do we know Vince McMahon didn't cry for help after he shit on her head? No, I don't think it was. I think this this the guy sent the scat because he he just seems like that type of guy. He just I can see it. Can see it. Because then because oh, well, I'm, there are other parts of that story that I it just like we knew it was bad, and then. And then he tried to only pay her a third of what they were going to pay her. He tried to, like, 
He, he tried to. <laughs> you get your pants during the threesome and then try to underpay. Fuck. <laughs> Jesus. And, and then, and then it kind of it calls into question one of his favorite catchphrases to say around the office. When he had an idea that he liked, you know what he always said? Well, that's that's good shit. <laughs> that's not good shit. Uh, but I also, I feel like there was one other thing I wanted to say besides check out the, <coughs> <coughs> the accessibility and comedy initiative. Yeah. Which was just the idea that, like, you can't shut people up. People are allowed to talk. You're allowed to talk about Delia. I'm allowed to talk about accessibility. If we're not being booked at these clubs, what are we really losing? What is anybody losing? I remember Chappelle said something about speak recklessly. Um, or something. I, re I remember him saying something about that. But I, I just, uh, you know, I just, you gotta, people, if you're listening to me, whether you're a comedian or you work in a job somewhere with somebody who's just being an asshole. And look, I'll stipulate to this. I've had three caregivers in the last year. So I've got a shit ton of turnover. And I'm not saying that's all them. <laughs> it probably is me. <laughs> probably at some point. But, but, but in part because when I sense somebody is unhappy or something that's wrong, I'm like, hey, it's something wrong. And that's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make the comedy world a better place. I'm not trying to be a crazo or bring anybody down or be jealous. Because let me just say, I'm not jealous of Tim Dillon from a comedy perspective. I'm not jealous of him from a moral perspective. Uh, there's no part of Tim Dillon's life that I would want to be a part of. There's no part of Chris Scalia's life I would want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. But I do want to be a part of the legitimate comedy institutions that I grew up loving and respecting. Yeah. And, and, and it's my job to be difficult. It's my job to be difficult because people like Daniel Perez and Greg Roquet and even Vince D'Amico um, <laughs> deserve a chance. Maybe not D'Amico, but I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I, you know, and all comedy clubs should be accessible, even the comedy chateau. Yeah, it's not, and it's not too much to ask. Well, I mean, yeah, not that I would ever go to the chateau, but you know, <laughs> if you were gonna go there, because again. We're all one bad day away from being in a wheelchair. And uh, I just wanted to ask if you have any parting thoughts or you want to tell people where to find you. And you can text it to me or I'll put it in the uh, link below. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll text you my social media. But, yeah, I, I just want to tell people to donate to the cause because it's like immobility is going to affect all of us if we're lucky enough to Eventually. live. Eventually. You know. It's like everyone is just like temp like being able bodied is temporary. Yeah, exactly. It's it's we're all on bad day or one really good day away from needing the wheelchair. <laughs> um no, if I ever get terminal, I'm totally gonna pull if I ever get terminal news, I'm gonna go Lamar Odom and just or I can't now because I yeah. I can't now, but that's theoretically what people should do if they get that news. Just yeah. party, party up. But I, I just wanted to spend the last couple minutes, and I don't know if this is something I should talk about on camera, but I want to open up to people about it um, in the last four, four and a half minutes. Um, as I was going through all this over the last year and a half, um, I lost the caregiver 12 years, we parted ways, that was sad, but then two months after that, a month and a half after that, um, I just wanted to tell everybody, I lost my older brother, and 
the guy would the guy was my birth caregiver and my best friend and I there are days where I don't feel like doing comedy ever again because I'm like my heart's been ripped out and I don't I don't really feel like ever being funny again. There is no more funny in the world for me sometimes. But I I I'm doing this because he he always believed in me and you know, even though we we fought and it breaks my heart, y'all, that we were on the bowling out when he passed away and I'm forever heartbroken. A lot it ain't worth it. Tell people you love them. Tell people you love them. Find a way. All that Hallmark stuff because you never know when a blind motorcycle can just fly into a bus stop and kill your brother instantly. Which, by the way, what do they mean instantly? Like, that's way too, like, can't they say it suddenly? Like, I was just like, what do you mean instantly? Like, <laughs> super convenient. <laughs> um, you know, it's like just get the fucking dictionary and look up an appropriate word. You know, it's like it was just highly inappropriate. You should never say somebody died instantly unless you're talking about Chris D'Elia. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, but also, so I'm brokenhearted, and I just want people to know if I seem a little down or upset. I'm brokenhearted, and I sometimes am miserable, and I feel like crying, but I don't cry. I have allergy attacks. Um, uh, but no, and I just want to say, finally, and the most importantly, Red Bar's watching. Red Bar's watching. Rest in peace, Chris Dorner. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> and uh, if I hopefully we see Sam Tripoli in heaven. Um, <laughs> He'll be fucking trans women in heaven. Oh, allegedly. Um, all right. On that note, uh, the world is round. Uh, check out the Mulligan podcast again sometime soon, whenever it'll be. Woo! Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thank you for being on.